I'm good. All right, let me just record this uh, to the cloud. All right, we're good. Okay. What's going on? Well, you know, we're talking about, uh, well, first of all, your Russia trade, which is just nothing but spectacular. Yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, what else were we talking about? Um, uh, yesterday, we were discussing the, uh, the Germans not happy with Trump with their attack on the SWIFT system. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Didn't you just love that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? I actually, they, who, I'm sorry. I know what Trump said, but what, who went after the SWIFT system? Uh, I, I, what was, uh, maybe it was a German finance minister or somebody from the ECB said that they were taking a closer look at, at getting around the entire SWIFT system. Oh, yeah, yeah, can you imagine that? Um, all right, uh, I, I know the Fed tomorrow. I didn't know whether we entertain any questions about that. Uh, there's so many different opinions. And now, of course, as you saw, the, uh, the short end got hit the hardest after the stocks ran up because I guess the market feels now um, that uh, uh, there's less probability that and I, and I stress that word probability that um, uh, that they won't that they won't cut tomorrow, uh, even though guys like um, um, Jim uh, Jim Grant uh, uh, has actually been looking at that. So and actually, I've been out there talking that there's a cut tomorrow, but we'll, we'll see. Uh, um, I think this rally in the stock market may put the Fed on hold, even though I think it's, uh, it's a mistake. And I think that's how Trump is playing this uh, by pushing, but uh, we could talk about that. I, I don't know. Uh, as, as much as the trade, the, you know, the composite trade with that Russian trade, of course, was to buy the ruble, which has actually performed very well here too. And I miss that side of the, uh, the rubles under 64 today the first time. In a little bit, but uh, oh, yeah. uh, people are now people are now out searching, and I think the even more interesting aspect of it, of course, was you saw the move in the European bonds this morning, which is totally off of Draghi's comments. Who, you know, this room knows as well as anybody. My, the, the you know, the world holds Draghi in high regard, and of course, I hold him in in very low esteem. I, I think it has been uh, terrible for the world. I think he's very dangerous. And uh, he plays kind of right into Trump's hands. Uh, this morning's speech was, I, I don't even know the purpose of it. Uh, I know that they're in Sintra for their annual meeting, kind of like the, uh, so they can mirror the, uh, the Fed who goes to Jackson Hole for their big meeting in uh, August. But uh, I, I totally unnecessary. And, and, and it forced, Trump's hand on that. So he's going to push this and I'll go back to, I got a lot, I got a lot of pushback from last, from the last blog I wrote about the uh, weaponization of the dollar. But if you don't think that the dollar is weaponized, you better rethink everything that you know, because there's no question. And uh, uh, Santelli and I got into a, uh, a very private discussion about it. And he thought that I was actually attacking Trump. I was not attacking Trump on that. I just say that's just a reality, you know, and whether it's justified or not, that's a, that's a discussion to be held elsewhere. I'm only looking at it from a market perspective. And if it's weaponized, how am I going to either avoid losses or actually make some money? So uh, that's, a, that's that was the only thing I, you know, I care about, you know, anybody who wants to politicize the discussion, that's your doing that, that ain't mine. So uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, and here we, the last time you were here, I just put up the euro Aussie chart, it was on the 10th. Yeah, I saw that you posted that, interesting. And now today you're getting the ORL on it, but it's right in a support and I don't believe the pattern. Actually, I think yeah. it's a better place to buy the euro and sell the Aussie. Yeah, you know, actually the gold is, I, well, the gold performed interesting today because yesterday what the gold did was, or 
from Friday on, I wasn't very attentive on Friday, but from Friday on, um, uh, it was, the gold was totally trading with the concept of, is the Fed going to cut or they're not going to cut? And then after uh, the Draghi comments this morning, when the gold really took a bid, the it was interesting because that was now that everybody is in this um, situation that the the you know and, and we've discussed it quite a bit here uh, it, you know it's one of the really I think high quality uh, conversations I've had with Matt and Angelo and others in this room when we talk about it it's a race to the bottom and it's I've been consistent about that and that's what's kind of trapping the Fed here too. Because everybody is going that route, and uh, and as long as the ECB can hide behind the concept of oh we have an inflation mandate, we have an inflation where it's nonsense. I'm not the only one that says it. Paul Volcker says it's nonsense. There are people who with really great uh, street cred, it's nonsense because it allows you to just keep playing with your currency. So and the more you push interest rates down, I no, I'm sorry. Ira, yeah, yeah, actually, Trump just tweeted a little while ago that he he saw this as very unfair to the United States, and uh, and of course he's talking about the dollar and and just what you're talking about. That's how Trump sees it. Uh, yeah, and well, you know what? And that was a, that was the purpose of when I talked about weaponizing the dollar last week, because once he he elevated the Commerce Department, which is of course is Wilbur Ross. Uh, over Mnuchin, I was, the title of that piece was going to write, uh, you know, the same as, uh, you know, Michael Corleone to, to, to his brother Fredo. Fredo, you're dead to me. Because that's basically what Trump did to Mnuchin. He may as well have said, Mnuchin, you're dead to me. He, he just can't get rid of him yet. But if, if Mnuchin had a backbone, he would resign tomorrow. But, of course, then his signature comes off the currency and his wife will be devastated by that. She'll have nothing to talk about <laughs> while she's getting her manny and penny. Well, so, the, the important thing is that – I think the important thing is that in economic history, you see competitive devaluations, you know, leading ultimately to a lot of problems. And, uh, you know, that's – you're talking about you – know, that's what you mean by weaponizing the dollar, and, and, and this is yeah, – you know, yeah. Europeans well, are doing and you know so right that's what everybody's doing you know the, look at the Aussies cut rates and yet their unemployment rates are low uh, the key the New Zealanders cut rates if you read the uh, actually the Bank of Canada uh, what's his name uh, had a wasn't Pelos but it was somebody else from the Bank of Canada had an interesting piece out yesterday uh, let me let me find it I actually uh, uh, it was uh, uh, Shumbri, and he has a piece from the Bank of Canada, flexible exchange rates, commodity prices, and price stability. And he talks about, and, and I happen to agree with this, that having flexible exchange rates has really helped Canada, just like it's helped Mexico. Mexico has not had a financial crisis since 1995, when they finally just let the damn peso float. And, and I argued at some very high levels because I was actually on a uh, oversight committee in Washington. Uh, actually, Sheila Bear uh, chaired it at the time. And were a lot of uh, economists who happened to be on the committee as well as uh, bankers were arguing that the, pay, that the Mexicans had made a mistake. I was arguing this is the greatest thing they could do is to float the peso and just let it float and let the market ascertain what its value is. And you know what? It's worked very well for Mexico. I'm a, I'm a big believer. If you let the market actually work, it'll do its job for you. Yes, I know, I know economies like China, when you're just breaking on the scene, you have different issues. But there's, res there's ways to resolve that, too, fairly easily without complicating the process. Uh, so, I, I mean, this is an issue going forward. And uh, this speech, Shumbri's speech from the Bank of Canada, it's a short speech. You guys should bother to read it. It's, um, uh, as he says in the speech, it's a critical part of the BOC's framework. So it tells you a lot. And these aren't, it's not like the Europeans 
are floating. The, I mean, the currency floats, of course, but the but the monetary policy is as much directed against against the euro as anything. And uh, you know, then they get to turn. In fact, uh, I've uh, I've got a little sadness in my life. Uh, my brother-in-law passed away. Sorry, I'm not trying to be a bummer, so I'm going to be going to Dallas tomorrow anyway. Um, so, but I was going to write a piece uh, last night because I, I think about this all the time because you're watching something interesting play out right now and it's playing out on the pages of the financial times. And what it is, is who's going to, of course, lead the ECB and the financial times being uh, such a, uh, an anti-German paper for the German uh, efforts to, uh, to, to block certain uh, elements of what other European countries want, the Germans, is, and you people in this room have heard me say it over and over again, they need Jens Wiedmann from the Bundesbank to head the ECB because otherwise they are really going to wind up with a problem with Germany because Germany is getting, getting totally screwed here through financial repression. And the response from the FT and Draghi and many others, and you saw it from the French bankers, uh, Coué and, and others. And of course, last week they pulled a little stunt where somebody actually put forth Olivier Blanchard's name to be the president of the ECB, which is ridiculous. But they're all trying to push back and Merkel's actually trying to stand tall here. And it's gotta be Wiedmann. And they missed a point. It's gotta be Wiedmann because you need the Germans to get behind the EU project 100%. And as long as the ECB is financially repressing the Germans, they have a problem. And that's the rise of the alternative for Deutschland. It's the, it's the rise of the, of the alt-right or, or the more radical right in several other countries. You even see it in the, in the Netherlands, Austria, anywhere where people are really coming up on the short end because of the policy of the ECB, you have pushback coming. And they, they just won't give into it because they're afraid of what Wiedemann will do. Well, you know what? We've seen what Draghi does. And if you, you are a moneyed person, if you're a part of the Davos crowd, of course you've loved what Draghi has done because he has, quote unquote, saved the euro, which has put a lot of money uh, in, in, in the financial elite's pocket in, in Europe. I mean, that, that's the bottom line of it. And everybody else can go, you know, uh, can go screw themselves. But so I was thinking about it and the way they sell it is exactly the way that, um, uh, that, um, Yellen and Bernanke have sold QE to the American public. And they would read letters. So you, you guys may recall this. Bernanke and Yellen would read letters where people like myself may have been complaining because interest rates were so low for so long and all you were doing was financially repressing and they admitted to it. But their attitude was stop crying because that's what they would say. They would openly say this in response. Stop crying. Your grandchildren have jobs. The stock market is up. Housing prices are are climbing stop crying sorry you're not getting anything on your on your money you're getting a zero return stop crying though it's better for everybody else so that's the same line that they read to the germans stop the crying you know we're all better for it the euro is safe so i, I figured that we may as well return to um monty python which is one of my favorites you know the, the life of brian and we'll start singing look on the bright side of life and I, and I think about that scene where they have the Messiah up on the cross, you know, and, they're, and they all, there's probably 25 of them on crosses and they're all singing, look on the bright side of life. And I think about how everybody in Europe, by the design of the European currency, has basically been crucified on a Deutschmark cross, whether you like it or not, that's what's happening and you're gonna wind up paying the price. And they, everybody may as well start singing, you know, Look on the bright side of life, because that's what they tell the Germans. Stop crying. Look on the bright side of life. 
but it's having a major political impact. And, and, and that's really the issue, and you're seeing it. And then he pulls this stunt this morning. If you think I'm kidding, let's look at, you know, Italian bonds. Italian bonds dropped 20 basis points this morning. 20 basis points. It's down to two. It's right where the U.S. is. Well, the U.S. is now 203. So we're at the 210 in Italy. The, the French 10-year note is zero. Zero. Think about that. And if you don't think that this is all broken, well, then, then, then you better provide an answer to me about how this could possibly be in a sane world. It's not. It's, a, it's an insane world. But that's the world we're stuck with, and that's the world we play in. And uh, uh, what, I, what, what can I say besides I, th that's just where we find ourselves. I'm just looking at the 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 F the the BTPs and you know they're at the 50 month they're at the 200 week on a on a, on a continuation. Yeah. It, so Ira, he it, can it, they, they can buy yeah. these they they can buy these you know these they can manipulate the value of Italian bonds in the end of the day and the market knows it and sure probably will the, the Italians can't afford to pay their debt back. In euros and they never will and and they'll jump out of that obligation somehow uh that's what i think it's going to happen eventually but you know i was i was watching gold this morning and it, and it popped back up to the top of its range and then kind of didn't follow through and other assets were you know breaking out and it, it well, I, I'm, glad gold? I, I'm glad you, you know it's an interesting comment and i'm glad you talk about that because if you watch the gold the gold has responded two different ways Okay, we know that the Bitcoin has actually put a really strong bid in here. So there is, and the volume on the Bitcoin is actually going up. And I'm not a touter of Bitcoin. Uh, as again, I, I love the concept of blockchain, and I'm really trying to understand it greater. And that's been my stance for three years, um, four years. But that's, that's, again, the world that we live in. So you have to pay attention to it. But the gold was up this morning, even with this equity market up. Then Trump comes out with that tweet about an extended meeting at the G20 with Xi. And of course, the market took a, a big bump. The bonds sold off for, for a minute. Uh, and gold dropped uh, $13. I was a little miffed at myself because I was actually trying to put on the silver gold spread this morning because I saw the copper strength with the stock market. And I go, oh, gold's awfully high. But I knew that the... Uh, that was the gold was up was as strong as it was because of the European because of Draghi I think and we're and we're getting a test of that now because even with the equity market up the gold is back up to at least 1351 after dropping to what I don't know what the low was and I had to go walk the dogs but I I think the low was about 1344 after the uh, after yeah, after the I mean yeah, yeah 4270 so I think. Yeah, so it dropped sixteen dollars. But it was interesting that the silver held up so well. So I was really pissed because I was going to buy silver in a big way and sell gold, and I didn't quite put it on because I didn't. And then all of a sudden that came out, and silver actually held. I mean, it broke down to eighty four on the July, but it did hold ninety one, ninety two. While the gold was, you know, it held a thirteen dollar break. So that was actually uh, a way to go. And I see the copper has had a very uh, significant rally here today but that's that's based on some good stuff coming out of the um out of the uh trump uh g uh meeting so uh, again we'll see about that uh so the market's getting a little more elevated but i could see that because the, the world has to deal now with trump and if he gets his way on certain things you know that this infrastructure program is coming it won't make a difference as far as real jobs but it'll be a it, it'll allow him to lock the Democrats into a, uh, an interesting position, and he'll he'll get the headlines of it. You know, Trump is all about time, as you saw this morning. He releases this stuff with full intent on how to impact the markets. Don't sell him short on that. He's he's come to understand this pretty well. Yeah, and I was just looking at the uh, the gold silver, and it's that's got yeah. an RL day in it. 
and it's right into its first uh, fib target right now with the silver trade yeah. over the 200 day. And, and I, we right. talked about that gold copper earlier this morning, Ira. Yeah. Um, and I was looking at it and I just thought it was more of a reaction off of, uh, hold on a second, let me get this back up here. Um, just a correction in the gold copper spread more than anything. Yeah. Well, it, it, you know, Judd, it, it may well be, but I just, you know, I'm seeing the individual price actions and I'm going, wow, you know, there's, there's some significant stuff going on here. Uh, hold, hold on one second. Hold on. See, because this you can see this gold copper spread there with the ORL. Oh, come on, where did it go? There it is. So that's kind of bullish risk assets. Oh yeah. So I don't know what. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I just put up. Uh... <coughs> Gold copper, I've got two of them, and they both look a little different. This one shows the ORL day yesterday and the blow off in the gold against the yeah. copper and follow through today. <coughs> okay. And then that's with gold first. If I look at yeah. copper first, it looks like it's a different chart. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, uh, you know, I. I but we, you know, we do have all these, these things are all going on and it's interesting. I, I, you know, I love to see the reactions after because the first reaction in the gold to the Trump tweet about the G20 was G was gold drop. I mean, that's a 1% drop. And that's been the standard rule of thumb because anything that, you know, okay, well the, then the tariff issue is going to go away and that's bullish. So uh, so the gold, but that's not what the gold's about. And, and that's why I'd like to see the gold close above, you know, that, of course, uh, this whole area that we know between 1350 and 1360. So we need a solid close over that. It'll be interesting the way it reacts tomorrow if the Fed does nothing. The gold ought to break off the nothing based on, you know, its um, recent correlated pattern. And I would take that opportunity to, to buy it on a, on, a, on a big enough break. Uh, of course, I, I'm not going to be in uh, touch. But that, that's what will be a really good test. But the gold did do what it has done for the last six months, which is when you get good news on anything that uh, resolves some of the global problems, it breaks. But... I, I am the way it was up this morning with the equity markets up, and I know Judd, I saw the uh, work on the uh, uh, on the S and P, uh, DAX S and P, and the DAX was really strong this morning. So that was all off of Draghi. You know, they're they're convinced that there's going to be a a bigger move into negative territory. Um, so. You know, it, it really propelled uh, um, it, it propelled a whole lot of different assets. And I would say the copper probably came off of that Draghi too. That Draghi speech this morning, for some reason, the market gave it a lot of, um, paid a lot more attention to it than we usually than they usually do. Cause most people, you know, Draghi speaks, okay, uh, you get a movement and that's it. Uh, but that one had uh, more staying power. And it's interesting because the Swiss and Euro are, are the only currencies still down. But when I do look at this, you know, I go, you know, and I looked at the uh, expiration um, situation from the peso, cause what this does is certainly make me love the peso more. It's hard to buy it, but that's another piece that I'm sitting here on that I haven't gotten myself to write yet, which is, of course, something we've talked about, which is the relationship of the peso to the yuan to the global supply chains. 
And, you know, that's still, and then I have to, you know, republish a piece on that because, uh, cause it's such, uh, it's such an important aspect to everything. And it's interesting that the, uh, um, White House fails to acknowledge that. That was like the stupidity of the whole thing with uh, Mexico. Because if you're going to go after China, you you have to secure those. And again, if I was the Chinese, I'd be buying up all those factories along the U.S. northern border, or I'm sorry, southern border and the northern border of Mexico, because I want into that game in a big way. And a lot of those uh, factories have been underutilized, of course, for 20 years or more. I just have a headline that just came across. White House explored the legality of demoting Fed Chairman Powell. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not. I think that's fake news. So, uh, yeah, I, I know. You know, it's, it just makes it so difficult to 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 meander around all this stuff. Uh, There's like 50,000 so, journalists who are trying to trash Trump every day and they write stuff like uh, that. I know. And... and and it's not only the ones who are trying to trash you, and then you got the other ones uh, who, I, all, you know, the creation of, uh, you know, uh, uh, live squawk, forex squawk, you know, and these headlines make it in to the media, to the mainstream media. Here, I got, I just got this. Uh, Cuddle says passing USMCA more important in short term than China trade deal. But it's actually something I agree with. Well, that's that's that bolsters the hand in the trade negotiations. So you want to have that. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, I mean, it bolsters you. So get the Mexican deal done. It's significant. Ah, oh, it's and that's and that's the board. But but it does get to be an interesting board because now we get to break out. Is the market more intrigued with interest rates? Or is it more intrigued with um, uh, trade deals? Well, Ira, I, I had I, I threw up a couple of charts. I threw up a peso and uh, against the yuan, and I've been looking at Mexico versus China, the high of the day today, and that spreads a 200 day. You know, uh, yeah. China totally ripped against Mexico. And the other number I'm going to throw up for you is in the gold that you need to pay attention to. Everyone needs to write down is this July 16th high in the gold at 1377 and a half. It was just an old target level and uh, it's now going to become a really big multi-year technical level. So the and last, what was that from last? Is that from last July? Is that what you're giving me? 2016. Yeah. Wow. Uh, hold on, let me see it. I'm going to visually. Yeah, you can oh, see it there it is. Yeah, yeah and that was where 16. the last big short trade came from in the gold. Yeah. Okay. Well, and, and which is important because if you go back, and I'm going to have to go back to some old blogs because I'll be I'll been on top of that. Uh, there was you know the stuff with China and uh, well, and we had the U.S. election. So you guys know you guys know Tudor Jones, you guys know Tudor Jones, and, and and you know he was quoted this week as saying his favorite trade in the next two years is gold. Yeah, I know, I know. What, and and I have great have respect. I, I have, <laughs> I have great respect for Paul, and you know what? Again, I I know Paul. I I I did actually manage money for Paul back in 1986 and 87. Uh, when he was too, I'm such a stupid person that I, um, that I, I didn't stay with him. He kept offering me more money. And I said to him, I said, no, that's too much money. I can never manage all that money. And I, so I just closed up my fund. <laughs> he says, you're making a mistake. I said, oh, you know, I got to do what I got to do. <laughs> Stupidest decision I ever made in my life. Well, it's one amongst many. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? What amongst many? Um, yeah. So, what do I think of that trade? Yeah, I think that's. I think you know, you guys have listened to me. I'm. I've been on the gold currency. I said I'm getting. You know, I want to lift the, my short, my long dollar 
because I would be long the Swiss mostly against, I'd be short the Swiss mostly against the gold. Um, so uh, I, I think he's right. Gunlatch is on the same page. Others are on the same page. Uh, they're right. And how it plays out, I, I, I'm not sure. But, it, but it's every time you get these central banks, and again, I, you know, I, I try to make people understand because because on mainstream, on, on CNBC, on Bloomberg, they always bring out what's the discussion. It's an inflation play. Gold is, you know, my my attitude is, it's not. And I've been consistent with this for so many years. Gold is not a, a, an inflation play. Is it ultimately? Yes. But the real reaction is in a fiat currency world that gold is a, a haven against the central banks losing control of the system they created. I have been on my, I've been writing my blog for 10 years and for 10 years, you can find that. And, and when I'm on CNBC with others, I've argued, I go, it's not, you're missing the point. Gold is a hedge against central banks losing their credibility. That, that's all. It, don't, don't take it more than that because once that happens, by definition, in a fiat currency world, the outcome is going to be inflation. When? I'm not going to tell. I can't tell you. But the, the real effect of gold, and if Tudor was here, I'm sure he would say the same thing, and I know Druckenmiller would, is that, hey, and Gunlatch would, the central banks don't fear inflation. That's, that's BS. They fear deflation. Listen to them. Draghi's comments this morning, what are they? They're not fearing inflation. They fear deflation. And that's what Bernanke feared, deflation. He told you that. And, and I would tongue-in-cheek call him a 37er because Bernanke would always argue that the, the major policy mistake of the U.S. government was in 1937 when the United States raised, they, they tightened, they went into fiscal austerity, meaning they cut the budget while the Fed was raising interest rates just as they were coming out of the, the, the depression. And that's what Bernanke's academic work was based on. Totally that. And he believes that. And that's, if you follow everything, it all flows out from that. So again, when they tell you, oh, there's no inflation, I don't know why gold's going up. Gold has done nothing, and rightfully so. What I would probably say, let me go back to it. Now I got to go back to the chart, but it's probably three or four years. Well, yeah, I mean, oh, the, yeah. The, the high was made, in, the last high was made in 2013 at, uh, at 1434. Right. That was six years. Well, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. After it came out, after it came out, and I'll tell you something, because you can go find it. I was on that Watchdog USA because he, he would read the blog. So I did a, an interview with him in uh, February of 2013. And, uh, and I got beat up by his audience because sometimes they're a little wacky. Because I said, <laughs> you can go listen to it. E everything I'm going to tell you is, is, is true. And they, they beat me up because go that's when gold was at 1640. And I was on... And I, we were having a discussion. His name is uh, Greg, Greg Hunter, I think. Uh, and it's his show, Watchdog USA. And I said, if I, you know, after all the patterns, I said, you know what? With everything the banks have done, I would be getting out of gold, some of my gold, 25 or 50% for sure up here, and buying equities. Because the central banks have righted the ship and now with these low interest rates, it's time to take some, you know, what, what everybody thought was going to happen hasn't played out and people are running into equity markets. And that's what I would do. They beat the hell out of me. I, you, you can go read the comments because it was posted. It's a YouTube piece. And uh, they beat me up. Meanwhile, I would like to have that trade, short gold and long S&Ps from, from that week in February of 2013. It wasn't a bad bad call but I, yeah. but I could see those things you know and, and I'm telling you 
they beat me up merciless. I was getting emails. Stuff didn't even get posted. And I said, yeah, you know, I haven't done one. I think I did one more after that. The cr that crowd is just too whack. It's like some of the people on Zero Hedge. Zero Hedge can put out some great things, but if you follow the commentary that that uh, no, I don't that, follow um, that commentary. <laughs> That's bad. It, yeah, it's it, the thread that goes through there can be absolutely brutal. I mean, these people. Are, so, uh, and I don't want them on my blog. I, you know, we we have blocked them, but. Uh, the person who edits my blog, we, we have absolutely blocked them. I don't want to engage in them. There's, I'm not, it's just not, I, I don't want that. I, I want to discuss, you know, potential opportunities or more importantly, as you guys know, sometimes how to avoid bad, bad situations, which are, which, you know, many times saving money is more important than making money. So, I mean, these, so, I think gold's time has now come again, and you see it. You know, somebody has a lid on it at this thirteen fifty sixty, um, and they've been selling options, uh, and they they have it locked in here. Will it break out of here? Well, when more and more people, well, let's go back to the Tudor comments. When those people are talking about you know being gold, gold is a play, him and Gunlatch for a while, they've been on this for a while, by the way, and yet. It's been locked in here because, again, why buy gold when I can buy equities? But it's not the, it's not the equities per se because gold is – and the equities can go up together as they've been doing really all year. It's, uh, it's the currency aspect of it, and that's the fact that the banks are willing to absolutely, absolutely uh, – here's a great word from my Marxist past debauch the currency they don't care they they truly don't care when when now when you go back to all these people doing their measurements there's 11 and a half trillion dollars worth of bonds that have negative yields seriously say that again and really go to sleep and go really 11 and a half trillion dollars of bonds with negative yields so why shouldn't I own gold? Because, you know, everybody says, well, you should never own gold because it doesn't pay you anything. Well, you know, I, now there's $11.5 trillion of different currencies that don't pay me anything either and tell me how it ends. If you tell me that it ends, that all wells ends well, okay, then you're right. Then gold well, will maybe, get beat up. But the, I should, maybe the European listeners should listen to you because their currency, look, you know, their, their central bank is – going radical so maybe they should listen to you they don't they don't care you know i'm a i'm a for a lot of europeans the stuff that i talk about it, it offends them and they'll tell you that that you oh no you don't you don't get it and i think i've gotten it pretty well for for uh 40 years of 42 years of doing this and and knowing the uh the Bundesbank and paying attention and understanding it and knowing what certainly has gone on in europe for uh, since the uh, creation of the euro, so but they don't want to hear it because again, if you're part of the European elite and you and and you're certainly part of the financial elite, you've got so much at stake. You've got so much at stake. You're, you're so much invested. You can't listen to any type of uh, alternative so because I, it would be have, too I devastating. You might enjoy. I have a quote you might enjoy, Ira. Yeah. So in 1992, I took a course at the University of Wisconsin about the European Union, and it was like a seminar course. And Professor Bob Kale, who was an old timer from the history department there, uh, yeah, I don't know if you recognize his name, but he this is 1992, he, and he was a left, you know, old school, very kind of left wing liberal, or described himself hey, as a hey. fellow traveler. I'm a Ph. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Wisconsin. What do you want to talk about? I, I, yeah, I know. I know. Was, this I, is what Bob. This is what Bob Kiel said in '92. He said the, the the European Union is being created for the benefit of the elites. Oh, it's just no question. And it's, I thought it, it, about it, that. What do you no mean question. by the elites? And I identified different, you know, different groups, yeah. including the bureaucrats. Yeah. You know. Well, you know what? Because if you were an elite in Greece, you're an elite in Italy, you're, you're part of the established elite in Spain, it was to your benefit because you wanted to have 
basically the Bundesbank running your money because that way you could you could devoid the political impact of it. I'm telling you, The Rotten Heart of Europe by Bernard Connolly is the most important book written for the last 25 years if this is what you're interested in. It's just a fact, and I'm trying to get somebody who will sell them all for me and everybody can just go to him, let him make the money. I don't care. I just want to... I can't do it anymore. It takes it's too it's too labor intensive, and I, I just don't have the time. But I have these books that I, I give them away. I, I I would stone cold give them away. To, I've offered them to universities, but it's it's so anti uh, the established view that a lot of people just don't want to hear about it. They don't want to hear about it. You say, well, that, how can that be? I'm gonna tell you what. When is the last time you've seen Bernard Connolly interviewed in the Financial Times? The Financial Times is not going to publish that. They are part of selling this narrative. And you can say, oh, you're full of shit, Ira. Okay, let's have that discussion. You can call me whatever you want, You can, but let's have that discussion. If you could teach me otherwise, fine. But if you're only going to regurgitate back at me what appears in the Financial Times, we got a problem. Because that's, that's the voice of what the establishment wants you to take away. And there can be nothing else. Because, listen, I, I've actually sat with fairly high level bankers, two years before the launch of the Euro. Euro was launched January 1st, 1999, who told me exactly what you just said about the elites. They said, you don't understand, because I said, you guys are crazy. I said, every economist who I respect who's looked at this has said that you're doing this all wrong. I could go show you one article after another. Martin Feldstein, may he rest in peace, wrote, uh, an article that was in Foreign Affairs in the 1990s talking about how they were doing this wrong. One of the, my favorite economists of the last 30 years, Rudy Dornbush, who's also deceased uh, from MIT, wrote a, a famous piece in the uh, in Foreign Affairs discussing how the euro is a totally flawed project. Uh, we can go on and on and on. And, you know, Milton Friedman, they, they all talked about it. Um, I know Robert Mundell will tell you, no, that it's, you know, it, it needs its regional base and da, da, da. But it was all structured wrong. And that's been the problem. And the Germans are, let me tell you this, plain and simple. And you could see it play out now. When the whole EU was put together, under the guise of the European community, it was the coal and steel, I'm going back to the 50s and 60s, and de Gaulle, de Gaulle famously said, Europe is France and Germany, and the rest are the trimmings. That's a quote. So it was all about France and Germany. And the French knew that there could never be another war in Europe. And that's a great thing. I have no problem with that. And the French needed to tie up Germany because the two world wars were all about, well, I would say, I'm of the school that says there was only one world war. It was just a 20 year hiatus between the end and the beginning of the the second phase Uh, was all about preventing Germany from gaining strength. So they figured when they put this all together, the European Union, that the French would use French diplomatic skills and French worldly ability to to put them as a counterforce to the United States, which is what they always wanted to be, and to the Soviet Union. And they would be able to financially tie down Germany. And the German industrialists would work for the benefit of all of Europe rather than just Germany. And that's really what the project was all about. And I heard Helmut Kohl himself deliver a speech, it was here in Chicago, saying basically that in 1995, or ni- it was probably later than that, 96 or 97, talking about the need for no more war in, in Europe. And that's a, absolutely what a, what a great uh, desire. But if you don't do things right, you can really make the situation worse. And right now, that's that's what's going on. So we're coming to a very important juncture, a very important juncture, because it's all about how Germany takes this burden upon itself. 
And it's a burden. There's benefits to it, and there's, but there are burdens to it. It's like the United States, the United States with the reserve currency. There's burdens. It has benefits and privileges, as the French would say, but it also has burdens. Everything comes w- with each. These are very important times. Uh, and, and you are really getting to crunch time. And you see it playing out. You know, open your eyes. People don't open their eyes. But look at the battle that's on. Look at the battle that's on for uh, for the control of the ECB. And make no mistake about it, it's control of the ECB. And where the French would say, we can't have a German run it. They, they voted against QE as we know it. We can't continue down this path. Uh, we can't let them in. Where I say, no, you're, they look at it wrong, that you need a German because you need the German to give it credibility to the German citizens. Because if the German citizens start to doubt the credibility of it all, well, tell me what the outcome is. Go ahead, tell me. I want to hear it. And anybody who's so who's an advocate for the EU so blindly, tell me what you think the alternative is going to be. Tell me. Oh yeah, so let me buy some French bonds for. Yeah, for let's buy some French bonds. I, I've had the D mark up while you've been talking. And the other thing yeah. of, for everybody else, guys, is that the Nasdaq bonds went to the 200-day moving average and stopped. So this whole capital flow that we've had out of, out of London's over. Ira, do you think that for now, and I mean for now in the short run, yep. like the next yeah. year, year and a half, maybe two years, that the psychology of the desire for these 28 countries, well, not all 28, but to stay in the euro right now is sort of deep rooted, but certainly that could change. The European oh. the euro as a currency, because right now it seems to me that the desire to stay in the euro, right, is um, or, or utilize the euro as opposed to going back to their native currency seems to be kind of deep rooted, but just for now. Uh, you know what? But the here here's the here's the the the, the mechanism of it. How do you go back to your own currency? The Greeks talked about it. And and they got and they got bashed, you know. And, but the Greeks weren't strong enough. Now, of course, the Italians are talking about it, and that blows apart the whole system. That's what they're afraid of. That's what they're afraid of, and they are terrified. They're terrified. That's why the Italians hold the upper hand here. And anybody who says they don't, better find a case to make it so, because the amount of debt that the Italians have on that have been placed on the books of the ECB through all this QE and through Target 2 of moving funds out of Italy into German banks and Austrian banks and Dutch banks. to Because if I'm in Euros, it doesn't matter what country I park them in. I may as well park them in those banks. Maybe the yeah. Italians will re-denominate their debt into something else, but stay in the, try to stay in the Eurozone. Yeah, it's gonna, but it's more difficult than you think. And again, what banks are going to take a hit? Because, again, we want to talk about the fear of deflation. You watch a credit crisis take place in Europe, and you will set the wheels of a major deflationary cycle right into place. And they know it. The, the Italians have the whole global financial system at their beck. So what choice are they going to make is the million-dollar question. Well, listen, you have a, you know, you have massive amounts of, of, of really strong uh, Italian manufacturing in the northern part, which is, of course, where uh, Salv- Salvini emanates from, uh, you know, with the, with, which was the Lega, which was originally the Northern League. Um, there, there's a lot of, so they have a lot at stake here, too. They just want a better deal. And you know what? They were always given a bad deal because, you know, everybody had, as, as Judd will show you with the Deutschmark, the Deutschmark had a valuation when it was pushed into the euro. The Italian lira had a valuation when it was pushed into the lira. The French franc had a, so these were all there. Well, the Italian franc was set 
the, I'm sorry, the Italian lira was set at too strong a level because the Italians, because uh, the French were very aware that that industry and business was moving to Italy when the when the lira was too weak. And if you think I'm making this up, go go read what happened after Soros broke the pound out of the uh, EU in 1992, out of the uh, out of the ECU because it wasn't the euro yet. Uh, uh, so when he broke them out of that, and the Italians followed, and the Spanish followed, well, the Italians, the Italian lira got beat to hell too, and and actually the fashion industry started moving from Paris to uh, Milan, and the the French were scared out of their mind because you know when you depreciate your currency and you have quality uh, businesses, you can gain a tremendous footing, which is why, you know, if you look at Brexit, you know, all the dire uh, uh, um, uh, the dire uh, forecast about what was going to happen to England right from the beginning, they were all wrong because the pound devalued versus the euro from 70 from 0.72 it went all the way to 95 I, I think so a lot of manufacturing and, and exports took place in, in britain let me i have to go put up the euro sterling cross we can take a good look at it uh oops okay. yes on, on the day when brexit was voted on uh, wow, well, we're we're at the anniversary week, so this is very appropriate. What the the euro the euro sterling was it would go to uh, June the week of June twentieth, two thousand sixteen, on the euro sterling cross. The low was seventy six on the cross. The next week after the vote, it goes up to eighty four. Well, that, that's a ten percent move or more. And then, as people panicked, we went all the way up to ninety four in October of 2016, right. and we've been hovering. So, the, you know, again, the, the British pound has provided an outlet for all the negativity because the pound is depreciated and it's really held up the British economy far better because a lot of people said, hey, they haven't shut out all these things, which is why the Germans are very nervous because the Germans have moved so much manufacturing and so much of their supply chains into Britain. You know, you have Honda and Toyota with huge manufacturing facilities, which is why they've been very vocal about the way the Brits do this. They have huge manufacturing. Um, others too, the Germans, BMW with uh, Land Rover and uh, the Mini Cooper, you know, all of this was investments that the Germans had made in Britain. And the, and, and, uh, the Brits run about, I think it's about an 86 billion uh, year deficit with the Germans, with the Germans. So the Germans are not very anxious about this whole Brexit thing because it could really, it could what it could do is result in German manufacturing moving to Britain to take advantage. This is what this battle is all about. This is about Brussels, meaning the, the European elite, wanting to punish the Brits for having the audacity to leave the Union, because the fear is. If the British do this successfully, this is not like beating up Greece. Greece was choked and strangled and was not big enough to have the, although it did have some impact at the time, but not nearly what Italy is, not nearly what Britain is. And, and Trump was, is absolutely playing this right by telling them, hey, we'll enter a free trade area with you. Yeah, don't worry about it. Exactly opposite of what Obama said. You remember what Obama said prior to to the Brexit vote, and this was prior to the vote. Back of the line, he said. Yeah, back of the queue. You're going to the back of the queue if you leave. Well, that was involving yourself in politics, by the way. So for everybody who yells at Trump for getting involved, that was pretty involving <laughs> as well. You know, you're basically campaigning but, for it. Ira, my wife's a Brit, and uh, that got her neck real stiff. What Obama said, and I, I think it actually played into the to the vote yeah you know what and it should have and a lot of brits i did i think that's right a lot of brits didn't like that going hey 
what do you think we're stupid? Don't, don't tell us that. But there was totally involvement in the, in it. And then, you know, another part where that foreign policy group was totally wrong, <clears> meaning uh, John Kerry and, and, uh, and the band of idiots. Uh, and again, that's not a political statement. That's just fact. Uh, open your eyes and see what took place and what was left. You know, I, I, I hold Trump in very low regard on a lot of things, but I don't blame him for the fo fo foreign policy um, predicament that he wound up in. That's a whole different story. Uh, but they involved themselves in it. There, there's no question. But the Brits haven't really suffered because, again, they've let the currency depreciate. They've let the currency depreciate. And they're happy about it. Mark Carney, God, we can't wait to get rid of him. He was a good central banker when he was at Canada, but he's been in way over his head with the Bank of England. Uh, the, his predecessor, Mervyn King, was a far more astute um, individual. It'll be interesting. I'm hoping that uh, they actually name uh, uh, the guy from the University of Chicago, Raj, uh, Rajaran, the Indian economist who ran. He, uh, he's a guy who I love. I read his stuff all the time. He, he'd be great because he <clears throat> understands the world. Um, but these are all things that are on the boil. And they're on the boil. I, I don't, that's why, you know, Trump's tweets about this and, and it gets all the, and that's what the, the markets are pegged to. And I know we can't trade this stuff. Everything I'm talking about, you're going, well, where's the value? But it does play into the gold currencies. And I, I don't know, Judd, I've been coming yeah. in this room f for four months. I've been very consistent about, hey, this is just an opportunity for that. And it's worked. You look yeah. at the gold Swiss. It's, well, look at it's gold, absolutely. Robert, Ira, look at gold pound. And I just put up the right. long oh, yeah. stream charts. Yeah. Of the quarterlies yeah. and semi-annuals, it's a huge breakout. Right, right. And the pound, you know, just sits there. But you don't hear the British complaining. They're happy. You know, they're not necessarily happy, but the pound's been caught in this range probably for two years between uh, 125 and we're at the low end of it, and 140, because uh, whenever there's different news, it, but that news is over because Theresa May is gone. And if they get, and if Boris Johnson becomes prime minister, you know, things are really going to heat up and the Italians are watching very closely because they're intricately tied to this. And the Poles are aware and the Hungarians are aware <clears throat> and they're not going, we're, we're not the trimmings. There's more important. And more importantly, Mr. Putin is very aware. He knows everything that's going on here. It's amazing how all of a sudden that pipeline the Nord Stream discussion was heightened, and now it's nobody's even talked about it. Nobody's talked about it because there is no easy way around it. And he's going to continue that pipeline, and he's going to make Germany and therefore more of Europe more dependent upon uh, Russian uh, energy sources. And he's building the lines. Of, there are things moving here. That's, that's you know what you have to treat these this politics like the market. Because the markets, they mirror each other in certain ways in that they're far more dynamic than people want to give them credit for. We always view these things with static glasses. But the world's not waiting. The Chinese are not sitting there waiting for Trump. You know, They're not. The things are moving. Things are always in motion. Uh, the, the, as you saw with the Europeans, you know, I didn't see that quote, but I will see it in a little bit on the SWIFT and how they're going to deal with it. You know, everybody's getting a little perturbed. The United States is overplaying this card of sanctions. And it's not just Trump. The Obama administration did it. The Bush administration did it. It's far, They're using a tool that the more you use it, the less effect it's going to have. That's just a fact, because people are going to learn how to, how to work around it. And that's what's happening. And then once you lose that tool, now you better rethink about a lot of things. So I wouldn't be so... If I was in this White House, I, I'd be a little uh, lax to start uh, utilizing all these tools that have supposedly worked in the past. But, uh, but that's where that sits. And that brings us back, and I'm going to, I know I'm, I'm not monopolizing too much time, but you guys are, if you have any questions, speak up now. Well, then Judge Michael will say, ask one question besides the dirty, yeah. rotten heart of Europe. What other yeah. macro books should he start reading to start learning? You know what? I'm, and I'm telling you, that book is a hard book to read. <clears throat> but again, 
if if you uh, if you uh, read the forwards, the one written in '95 and the one that was updated in 2012, because don't forget, Bill Shepard and I we reprinted this book. It was out of print. It was selling for $800 on Amazon. There were 200 copies in the world. Um, now there's 10,000, and I control <laughs> and you have 6,000 of them. <laughs> no, 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 no. But I have more than I want. But don't do anything to get the book yet, because I'm going to put it in the blog, how you can order it from this one bookseller who's, who will actually really do a good job of getting it to you. And I, I will do it, and it will be the last time. Other, other than that, I don't know what I'm going to do with these books, but I have to, you know, I pay to store them, and I'm getting tired of it. So uh, I'm just, I've offered them to university. I said, you know, just pay me, pay me $5 a book, I'll ship, I'll get them to you. Pay me, you know, but the, it, we live in a very lazy world, and people tell me, oh, I'll get it on, uh, I'll get it on, uh, what should I call it? Uh, uh, on my Kindle. I go, you can't read this book on, the, on your Kindle. It's just not readable on a Kindle. It's it's very dense, and there's things that you're going to want to re reread. It's like I have books that I cannot possibly read on a Kindle. Can't do it. So, And besides the point, if you, if you buy it on Kindle, you are enriching uh, the publishers who took it out of print, and they didn't want any, what I called them, with Bernard's, uh, Bernard Connolly wrote the book, with his approval to republish it, they laughed at me. These, so if you buy it on Kindle, all you're doing is giving them the money, and they don't deserve it. Uh, so I, Rebecca, on the yeah. topic, my glass, what to read. Yeah. And I would say, yeah. if you read The Economist, if you read FT, you are reading a, a, a point of view which is being discredited. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think that's right. And I never thought that way. The, the publishers are favor and favor. But that's, that's exactly right. I, you know what? The FT is just, it, it's, like, it's like the Washington Post right now. You know, it, it doesn't matter. Trump could really walk on water. It doesn't matter. They would, they would say that, uh, you know, he, he, stepped, he killed four ducks while walking. You know, that, it doesn't matter. It, and that's what the FT is. The FT is that's now, what Jed would say. Uh, no, it just it, it, the, the FT turned into the Wall Street Journal, so you can't believe anything that's written. I mean, no, I wrote no, a actually, couple of a, a couple of decent yeah. sources. You know, look, Daniel Lacaye, uh, Gav yeah. Cal Research. You know, Lewis Gav right. had a good interview in Barrons yeah. this weekend. You know, you I, probably I saw it, it right? Yeah. No, I didn't. I didn't see it. I was I wasn't oh, uh, traveling, I so. Oh, check it out, because I know you get you read yeah. Barrons. I know you do. I, I do read Barrons. Yeah. Yep. You know, I mean, there's stuff all over, but if you want to start paying for, you know, really good drill down kind of stuff, you know, Stratfor Research has has lots of stuff. Yeah, you know what, George Friedman, I'm not a fan of. He's good on certain things. Uh, other, I think his economic analysis is really weak. It's, I, I've thought that for years and years and years. Uh, Ian Bremmer, I, I have no tolerance for. Uh, I just don't think that the, the Eurasia group is... Is, is is qualitative at all and i say that uh because my son's in a think tank that competes with them and it's uh, nobody would pay for, i mean their work is very expensive they do very uh yeah i'm not, I'm not a fan either it, i'm not a fan either uh, i you know there people are just when i see them and the things that they discuss about uh I, i'm telling you i start reading the south china morning post it's better than the ft uh, but I'll let my subscription because I paid for three years of that. And then I'm going to go back to the journal only because like, uh, you know, you can read Gerard Baker. Gerard Baker came from the FT years ago. John Authors, who I love, who's great. He's at Bloomberg uh, writing. And you've got to subscribe to that Bloomberg. You can actually get those articles on that. I'm not paying for it yet because it's just, I, I, I'm so tired of all the stuff that I was reading for free. It's like with my own stuff, you know, now I'm paying for it. Uh, so I kind of wait for, uh, but he, all, I think so many of the good people left the, the FT quietly. You know, I didn't make big noise about it. So authors left, uh, Gerard Baker left. Uh, there's others, there, there two who I still like, who are still there. I, 
I don't mind Wolfgang Munchau, he, he, but he's now in the fir- firm camp where he used to criticize the EU. He's not so critical. He tries to write it with a more favorable outcome. And Martin Wolf is unreadable. Uh, but John uh, Plender and John Desard, I think, are, are both very good. Actually, I talked to John Desard. I think that came for you, Judd, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah Desard and I actually have had some long conversations, and he'll send me uh, something at times. So, but they're, the good people are, are, are really leaving um, because it's just, you know, again, I call it Mary Poppins, and everything's with a spoonful of sugar. I don't want sugar. I, I want some some genuine discussion. I I just posted uh, uh, Daniel Lacaye's English version of his blog. Okay. He does it. He does it in Spanish too, since he's based in Madrid. Yeah, or and he's teaching. I saw in London. So I actually. Yeah, he does. I have to. Yeah. I have to send around. him an email. Yeah, because we did. That was really one of the best podcasts I've done. Uh, you, you can follow him on Twitter too, everybody. He's very active on Twitter. Oh yeah, I see that. So, and also, I just I just got an email from uh, the Financial Repression Authority. That I'm going to do a uh, podcast with. Uh, this will be interesting with David Rosenberg and Bookvar, July 9th. So I look forward to that because that that'll be worth doing. I like those two bright guys. Yeah. Yeah. David Rosenberg has been, you know, he, he, he's married, he, he's buried in the bear camp, you know, and, and that's the advantage I have over these guys is because I'm a trader. I, I don't get, you know, I can, I can be much more, uh, to use Soros's words, reflective, <laughs> reflexive in, in my, in my views than, than they are. So, uh, I, I don't know. Um, for me. I don't know if you got into this. Um, I came in when you were discussing uh, the great con job that the French perpetrated on Germany. You know, using yep. the issue the yep. issue of war, which is noble. Right. I get it. Okay, yeah, but that was the noble. great con job. Yeah. Um, right. Oh shit! I forgot what I was going to say. Sorry. <laughs> hey, I'm the only one allowed to swear. What is this? <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, I remember what it was. Uh, Uncle Mario. Uncle Mario. Oh, Uncle, could, Mario. Uh, Uncle Mario. He he could have um, made this speech or conveyed this viewpoint two weeks ago when the ECB met, or any day last week, or even yesterday. But he chose today. Yeah, I find I, I find that extremely curious. I don't know about you. I, me too. Me too. And you know what? I think it was a great mistake because all he's doing is feeding Trump. He's feeding him. Yeah. Because he makes. Oh, he's making well, you know what? Trump, Trump did uh, post some crap on Twitter early this morning uh, right. about uh, about Europe uh, devaluing their currency. He was going off. Right. Yeah. He was talking about the DEX. <sighs> You know, so yeah. I I don't know what Mario was thinking. Well, he what is he thinking? Listen, I think he gets far too much credit. That's my thought. Okay, yes, he his whatever it would take save the euro, but I will always ask at what cost? At what cost? And what and will you if if they screw the Germans here? I'll tell you what. I, I get very, uh, I'll be even more nervous for Europe, especially because don't forget, the French are getting everything that they could dream of here, and yet the French nationalists have gained tremendously too. You know, I don't mean, forget, it, both, both the, mainstream the, political parties in France have been absolutely tossed to the dustbin of history. Macron didn't, I, you know, he's not, he's not one of the established parties. What I can't understand is how the hell are the French getting away with all of this? You know, because I, it's, it's there's a reason. Well, because they speak to the hearts and minds of the world, you know, but when you really look to see the danger of France and there is a danger in France because they've pushed this and pushed, they're still pushing it. 
And now Merkel had told Macron, Macron, don't forget, in, 2000 and tw- in 2011, Sarkozy, which at that time, the French and Germans were so close that if you remember, the media referred it to Merkozy, right? They were cats at the hips, Merkel and Sarkozy. It was Merkozy. And when, when, and it was a big mistake by Merkel, and I, it's, you can, it's in my blogs, I wrote it in real time, not to have Axel Weber, who was then the president of the Bundesbank, as the head of the ECB, because the Germans were pushing for him. And the compromise was Mario Draghi. Yeah. Now, do you know anything about Draghi. the new guy? Uh, do you know anything about this French guy, Benoit, whatever his name is, that the French want yeah. to head the ECB? Yeah, he, 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 he's an absolute pathetic who's been positioning himself. It would be it would be Draghi on steroids. Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So last week, I, last week on Friday, they threw out the name Olivier Blanchard, who has credibility because he was the chief economist for the IMF, and Blanchard's been out there, and now he, I think he teaches at Harvard right now. Of course, you know. What the hell, if you don't teach at Harvard, what could you possibly know? Um, so somebody suggested that he should be the compromise candidate for the ECB. Because the Germans, there's no way Correa is. If you read the FT, Bernard Correa is already the head of the ECB, if you read that. Or the other idiot from France. It, they're already the head. But it ain't, it ain't going to happen. I'm willing. Anybody who wants to see who's that, you know, I, I want, I want a few small bets. When they told me it was going to be Larry Summers, and again, it's in the blog. I said there's no chance because Elizabeth Warren, and Sherrod Brown, and David Vetters were never going to allow Larry Summers to be the uh, chairman of the Fed. No way, no how. He was too close to Wall Street, and especially Elizabeth Warren. And that was her first real thing she did when she got elected was to be able to block him. And she and they did block him. And that's why you wound up with Yellen, because everybody, you know, but I, I can tell you this, Steve Leisman and Larry Kudlow were on CNBC going, oh, my sources tell me it's Larry Summers. I wonder, and I called, I, I called Santana up one day, and I said, oh, I know. I sent Kelly Evans an email, because Larry Summers was on Kelly Evans' show going, oh, it's, my sources tell me it's absolutely Larry Summers. And I emailed her. I said, tell, tell Larry Kudlow how he will bet him $100,000 and the money will go to charity of your choice that it's not Larry Summers. And she emailed me back because I have their emails because I've been on their shows. And she emailed me back. She says, no, I'm not going to ask him. I'm not going to tell him that. But there's no way. There's no way. Just like in 2017. Uh, I, you know, I, I think Trump figures he should have had Yellen, but I think Yellen would have been dangerous because I think there is a cabal that exists within the Fed, and I think Leo Brainerd heads it. That at one point would have done anything they could to undermine Trump. I'm not sure that that still plays out, but I think you're right. It was it was interesting to me that Trump passed on Yellen because Yellen, with her. Uh, far more uh, dovish and, and could get her to turn. And I think he realizes that now, but that's another one of those, because Mnuchin supposedly, supposedly from what I hear was the big Powell proponent that this is the guy you got to have, you know, da, da, da. so, you know, that's the way that I understood that, but, but I would have been skeptical. And then they put summers forth again in 2017. That was, that was a, a no brainer. But I, I, if they're smart in Europe, they will put a German at the head because it's already gone so far. The Draghi has trapped, has laid a trap here that's so deep. What difference does it make? What do you think Viedman is able to do? But Viedman would able would be able to give Germans some comfort that a German was at the head of the bank. And even if he had to go for more QE, it was being done under the hand of a German. I think that's important. And that's been my, my case in, in arguing for, for Viedman. 
but I argued for Axel Weber. I thought it was a mistake. And I, and I thought that Merkel got beat by uh, Sarkozy because, again, the French just don't want a hard money, a potential hard money person at the head of the ECB. So that's the world in which we live in, and you have to be attentive to it. And we only care. I don't care about the politics of it. I don't care. I don't care about it. I, I'll form my own views. I only care about how it's going to impact the financial markets. That's all. The well, whole object, on that note, guys, is to find ideas that we can articulate and make money on and forget it. Yeah. Yeah. Everything else is just, you know, commentary, <clears throat> as they say. Because, so, like, you know, again, you know, one idea in that vein is, is gold. I think, you know, if gold starts taking out thresholds, it, that's really indicative of things. And you got to pay attention. You know, and plus, you can make money on gold, but it could mean other things, too. It could mean deflationary things. Are happening. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, 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 and I remember before you mentioned if the yuan breaks a threshold <laughs> of seven or something, that's a huge red flag. So that's another one. Right. Yeah, and well, the yuan you know, is weakening today. It's got no RLD going on. You I mean, mean it's the dollar, it's dollar or the yuan? Yeah, it's strengthening. You, you, yeah, you you mean the dollar is weakening? Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know. You know what? And and that's 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 key. And I'm going to end this. You know, here, but it, as you know, I I uh, texted you the other day, Judd, or emailed. Watch the ag stocks here. You know, forget that corn prices are up. And we've talked about this, you know, that what's going to happen when the Chinese realize that U.S. prices are going to higher? Are they going to take off those tariffs and buy as much U.S. grain as possible? Be very attentive here. Because, you know, you can have a strong opinion about something, but at the end of the day, politics and food is probably the most important element in China. Especially if your economy starts. You better make damn well sure and now you've got a bigger middle class to feed. So let's see here. You know, well, that's Cargill 101. Able... That's Cargill 101. Yeah, if you're a dictator and you don't pay us our money for grain, you have a revolution. You're 100% right. You just pay attention here because there's no question that the U.S. crop is going to be much smaller than, it, than people anticipated three or four months ago, um, both beans and corn. But the interesting thing is, is that the the uh, fuel mandate is really going to could really potentially blow up corn prices here because they raised they raised the ethanol mandate. You know, so now well, this is going to get crazy. This could get crazy. And the only reason I bring that up is, is you know, because I know we speak equities in this room too, and it's not like I'm an equity guy. I, I don't claim to be. But when I get a big global macro view. And I can find equities that will direct me, just like I did with the Russian. And I'm not doing it to blow my horn because I can be wrong, as wrong as I can be right. But we've gotten a 6% move out of that uh, Russian play. Um, yeah, what'd but, you buy? You bought it the fifth, below 22. I bought, I bought, yeah, I bought it at 22. Uh, but nutrients and bungee are stocks that are technically starting to look interesting. I mean, they've just, people have not been involved in the ag stocks, and I'm not talking about the ETFs. I'm talking about the individual ag stocks because, of course, as the dollar is strengthened and the Trump tariffs, these stocks have been dead dead money for, uh, let me see, Bungie. Bungie's at the 50-week 50, 50 moving average today. Yeah, and it's been... And it's been dead money for so friggin' long. Uh, dead money. Look at the quarterly but, IRA. Yeah. Hold That's on. where it gets interesting because it's trying to put an ORH quarter and it's a big bottoming pattern. Right, right. I, yeah, I, I see it. And the stock has been dead money. Dead friggin' money. And I'll be the first to tell you, I own it. I own it. I've, I've owned it from highs. I've owned it from lows. I've... You know, at one time somebody was, you know, what's it called? Was willing to pay uh, the big mining company wanted to pay eighty five dollars a share for it or something, and you saw it. This stock has been way underperforming, but now all of a sudden with grain prices, it's it's actually marrying the rally in the grains. 
as is NTR, which is the old potash. You know, that was, uh, hold on. Yeah, and I threw up mosaic uh, a couple of minutes ago, too. Right. And you see, this is now back above the 200-day, and we're going to approach, you know, uh, the high when it was the high May, uh, back in February. But this, these are now all starting to get interesting. So I just, I mean, I, again, you know me. I, there's nothing I tout. I just discuss things. And if you can find some value out of that discussion, great. If you can't, okay. But uh, I, I think the more you, you hammer out these, the more discussions we have and the more we hammer out these things, the, you know, you, you find, again, it's all about finding investment opportunities. Everything else is nonsense. Uh, uh, you know, as I, as my kids are quick to remind me, uh, you know, we had a saying at our dinner table, which was, everybody has a, opinions are like assholes. Everybody has one. Do with it as you may, but it's really true. I can listen to people's opinions. I don't care. I, and I come out, I really, I, I wish we, you know, we would engage more. I, I, I'm not here to, to, to just lecture. And just, I like being questioned and being pushed at because it gets to better ideas. And I think this room has been great. I, I, I love coming on here because it's helped me sort out a lot of ideas for myself. You know, Ira, if you don't want to pick individual names in the agribusiness <laughs> space, uh, there's yeah. an ETF called Moo, M-O-O. Yeah, yeah, I'm very familiar with it. Yeah, you know, and I'm just not an ETF. I, the only ETF I own is RSX because and EWG because I keep playing in that. Uh, although it's really underperformed relative to the DAXs. So, again, is Trump going to come back at Europe? You know, again, we'll talk about weaponizing the dollar. You know, last week he was busy talking about you know the German automotive sector. You know, so. There's all these things, and these are important things. This summer is not going to be boring. Promise you, it is not going to be boring. Well, good. <clears throat> and Ira, there's a there's a small cap EWG. It's called EWGS. Oh, is that right? I don't yeah. Okay, but I, I, you know what? I've been, I've had this goofy play on. The play is absolutely dead even where I've been long EWG, a dollar for bottle racist versus uh, uh, sh uh, short SH, which, which is that silly uh, S&P, uh, sh um, whatever, short. So the play is, I, I've had the play on for six months since the beginning of the year. Since the beginning of the year. And I'm dead, I am dead even. And, Six months. I mean, talk about stupidity. But I get a dividend, and I pay a dividend. So, yeah, I'm dead even. The whole place, dead. how stupid. I want to invest for income. Yeah. <laughs> well, I get a dividend. Hey, I want to invest for income. Hey, RS, RSX has a 4.5% dividend. It does, yeah. I know, I know. It's, you know, I, I listen, it's... It, I just, it just caught my eye only because we had such massive divergence between the price of oil and the Russian uh, equity uh, that it caught my eye. That's one of those things that we sort out and find. Tell me what's going on, you know? And when I see divergence, when I see a long held correlation start to break down, I wake up and pay attention. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you what, I, I'm, well, let's go back to, are the ag stocks telling me that G and Trump will be a more positive because G, G may be finding a way to give Trump a, a, uh, a, better, a better outcome and going, you know what, I, I'm going to outlast him anyway and I'm going to slow dance the shit out of him, but I have to secure that there's food for the Chinese people. That's all, that's his job, that's job one, as we say, right? Yeah. Ira, can I, can I read you a quote from Louis Gav? Sure. I, I like Gav Kell. I, I, okay. I'm, I'm, I, I don't know them, but, you know, for all the people I know in this world, uh, uh, he does, he does, they're very bright. I think they're right yeah. out of Hong Kong now. They, they are. They have been. But here, yeah. here's what he yeah. said. He said, now China is in full-on nationalist mode. 
talking about unequal treaties back to the opium wars. How do you walk yourself back from that unless the U.S. gives up massively? And if you're Trump, at this point, what do you gain by compromising with China? Okay, so, you know, see, that's why I like reading guys like that, because he talks about the opium wars. And if you think the Chinese don't think about the opium wars, you're mistaken, because that colonialist past does not sit well with them. I have a book from 1898 that I go look at called, it was written by a British um, foreign service guy called The Breakup of China. And I bought it at, uh, I love going and finding old used books at Mags Brothers. I bought it. And it's an original edition. It's, I like to buy those too. Uh, and, it, and it's an amazing, with maps and everything. It's great. It's, I have it in Arizona. I don't have it here. Uh, and it's great because they don't forget these things. They don't forget when the colonial powers were busy cutting up a weak China. They don't forget that the, what the Japanese did at the rape of Nanking and just the overall impact. And as I said, I can't wait. I'm trying to make this happen. I don't know if I ever will. I hope he doesn't die on me. But you know, I, I bring up uh, Sidney Rittenberg. These, yeah, somebody just mentioned stuff. that here, that they love that deal that you brought up the last time. Peter yeah, Guernsey. It's, yeah, it's, these are real things you learn from them because the media doesn't give you that because they don't dig deep enough. That's not what sells. But these are the things you have to be attentive to. And Galkel says that. Those opium wars. Now, I don't know if you know what the outcome of the opium wars was, and what, but it was a British attempt. China had a, a silverback currency and, the, and, and in an effort to weaken them. The Brits, of course, you know, shipped in opium, which the, then the Chinese ran a massive uh, deficit, and they were shipping silver to uh, to the UK, and basically was devalued. <laughs> it devalued the entire Chinese treasury, which I am fully expecting. I can't tell you when that the Chinese become bimetallists because they don't forget when silver backed the Chinese currency and the importance it had for sustaining the, uh, the emperor at that time before the fall and before the crushing of it by colonial powers. These are important things to the Chinese. These are important things. And to, 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 to minimize them and to think that they don't, you know, play a part in their thought process. Not that I know what the Chinese thought process is. I'm not claiming that. But if you do read enough of them, they are, they are cognizant of what their history was, and they're cognizant of the Western uh, impact of Western colonialism on China, which they really believe weakened them and brought them the devastation from the Japanese, you know, the Sino-Japan War of prior to the, uh, to the onset of World War II. So, these, yeah, so I, and, and it's, yeah. Yeah, Ira, we got one guy here in the room, Michael, he's from Taiwan, wanted to say something. Yeah. So chime in, Michael. All right, can you hear me? Yes. All right, so um, in response to Angelo's question that he asked, okay, how can China walk back from uh, like opium wars and uh, nationalism? Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a potential political power grab that's happening in the communist party right now so if you okay if we walk back two weeks from today yeah. that was when yeah. um, the hong kong government was trying to pass the uh, extradition bill right mm -hmm. so any crimes that is committed in hong kong that's in relation to the chinese government will be extradited back to mainland China, you know, throwing a big uh, yes. black, black hole or something. Um, so they are trying to pass that bill, but um, people gathered and they protested. So that bill is postponed indefinitely. It's not withdrawn, mm -hmm. it's, it's not withdrawn, uh, but it's just right. postponed. Okay. Right. So um, behind this, I think that there is a 
power between the far left and the far right inside the Communist Party. So Xi Jinping, that he's、mm-hmm. very famous for his um, 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 anti-corruption and、um, his spectacular power grab、right. back in 2011, where he beat his Bo- opponent we- and, and and got the president. We- we- right with Bo Zhilai. Right, right, Bojai. Yes. Right, right, Bojai.、Yep. Yeah. I'm, so I'm, I'm cognizant. Yeah, keep going. Yo, so, so see, he's far left, and Bojai is right wing. So he he wants、yeah. to you know、uh, to show goodness to the West and you know bring Chinese people to a more wealthy state and you know globalization and all that. But recently, there's a there, there's been a development in, inside. Of the Chinese Com- Communist Party, that some of the old, like third generation,、uh, fir- first generation、uh, communists, are criticizing Xi's approach to this trade war because、mm-hmm. their because their interests are so deeply tied to the Western countries. You know, they yes, send their yes, kids、I、to、agree. United States, to Switzerland,、right. to England.、Mm-hmm. You know. They have their yes, assets yes. in Australia, Singapore, and stuff. So Xi Jinping is trying to、um, block block all the channels that you know converts the、uh, Chinese yuan to U.S. dollar,、mm-hmm. but they don't like him doing that. So Xi Jinping is in a、um, bad position right now because you know Chinese. Economy is in, in decline, and the relationship with the、um, develop developed world is worsening. So,、yes. and 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 I think Hong Kong, this this protest in Hong Kong is the last straw,、um, or the na- last nail on his coffin. He has to cave. He has to cave. He has to, or he will lose support from the from those、uh, first generation communists. So, so you you think he has he has to sustain、uh, Carrie Lam, Carrie uh, Lam in、uh, in Hong Kong or or I I'm no, not sure. No, he, he, he ditched、it. her already. He ditched her. Okay, okay, all right. He yeah, cut he, ties. He can't he cut al- ties with her. He he can't afford that to blow up. He just right. Right. I right. I, I, I、so、agree. I agree with、pay. I I agree with you. Yeah. So he will walk it back. Yeah. We, yeah. In what way? I、yeah. don't know, but he has to walk it back. Yeah, well, you know what, Michael? Think this is really an important discussion, because I also, when as I read, and you know, and again, I do not pretend to know as much as you know. I I've read a lot, and I've I've studied under some great people on China, but but here's what I what what I do know. That the issue going forward is I I've seen more and more comments from. From uh, like uh, Deng Xiaoping's children or and relatives who all talk about the J- Deng Xiaoping methodology, which is you know to keep a low profile, do、right. great things, right? But don't brag、right. about them. And, and I see this seeping into the media more and more. So I I I love the point that you make because I I think that's right, and I think that.、Uh, That she may actually be, you know, going well. Maybe I overplayed a little bit here, and and it's interesting. Well, you're from Taiwan, or、uh, I'm from、uh, mainland China. Oh, you are from mainland. I'm sorry. So, because I find it interesting too with the noise from Taiwan, and I tell people that the story, the issue of Ta- of Taiwan is important, and I I think that Trump made a mistake by selling those tanks or announcing that they were going to sell some armaments last week. I think it's a mistake. Because it's provocative. It, I, it is, but it, it, it's it's provocative. Listen, Nixon went to China in 1971-72 not only because of the Soviet Union, but the U- United States was very aware that we were not going to risk a thermonuclear war with China to keep Taiwan independent. That was a ridiculous policy. It was part of the Cold War policy, but it had run its course. And so basically, Nixon had given the okay about a one-China policy, but 
it would all happen in due time, just the same way the treaty was signed with Britain and China over Hong Kong, right? 50 years. Right. And after 50 years, so, you know, these are things that are changing. I think Trump made a big mistake. It was, first of all, the, chi- the Taiwan Straits has been an issue, and, and China used to lob missiles at Taiwan, uh, at Kimoy and Matsu in the 50s on a regular basis. I mean, there's always been noise. That the Chinese let the world know that, yeah, we're not strong enough to rectify this, and it's not done yet, but in due time. And that's one of those in due time. So uh, I'm, I'm getting to your point. I think it's exactly, you, you make a great point. Because where does Xi go? I think Xi may take a, a, a less noisy course. And I think he may, you know what, give Trump a little victory because that's all Trump wants. And Trump will give him a little victory and everybody can get quiet for a while. Right. And that's why I come back, I come back to the point about food. Because with the swine outbreak, which has driven up pork prices, of course, but China is now a much more advanced country. And it, it has ways around that too. So you know what? more chicken, more beef, and, you know, there are ways to deal with it. Yes, pr- hog, hog prices are going to be high in China for a while. That, that's, uh, swine flu is very, uh, uh, it's, it's a decimating uh, thing, but I, I, I think you're right, you know, and, I, and it's funny that you were having this conversation because I was just rereading uh, over, over the weekend about uh, Beaujolais and his wife and all the things that went on uh, and how some of the people, yeah, I was reading about it because some of the people who were involved in that have not let go of that. You know, we, we don't hear about it in the West, but that that action by Xi doesn't sit well with some, I, I, is what I'm trying to say. So, uh, no, it doesn't. Yeah, you make a very, very interesting. It's, it's a rooted interest between the Chinese higher ups and the, uh, the well being of the world economy because they, they don't leave their assets inside of China. No, right. no one will. So it, 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 yeah. if, if the condition between China and uh, U.S. worsened, and they, they don't get anything. They yes. I, that's, I, why, I, that's why they're pressuring, they're pressuring Xi to make the right decision, right. <laughs> not Right wing, right, right wing or left wing, right. Yeah. But they're they're make, making him, forcing him to make the decision that's beneficial to them, right? I, I, exactly. I, I think, exactly. I, I think chi- China and, and and U.S. must sustain a good relationship, um, not because of the producer and consumer um, relations, but mm-hmm. to the whole world, to the stabilization of the world. These two mega powers must be aligned. Their interests must be aligned. I, 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 agree, I agree wholeheartedly with you. You know, and, and as I say in my blog regularly, you know, because when people talk about politics, I say, I don't care. I'm, I'm like Deng Xiaoping. As long as the, if the cat is white or black, doesn't matter as long as it catches mice. Right. You know, stop trying to make yourself doctrinaire. It doesn't work. And good trading requires not to be dropped or near. What works? And that's what I want to adapt. You know, you can believe whatever you want to believe. The world is a far more complicated place than most people want to ever admit. So they latch on to simple things. But I agree. And I'm a big, uh, my favorite political science teacher, professor, who I've read for 50, from the 45 years. I'm not going to make myself older. Graham Allison, you know, last year wrote a book called The Thucydides Trap. And good political, good international politics, you, you make room for a rising power. You don't have to knock them down. You make room for a rising power. And how you do it and the intelligence in which you do it is what will evolve in the world. I, I agree with every word you said. I think China and the United States has many things to share. And, you know, the West, now they're going to beat them up about, you know, what's going on in Xinjiang with the Uyghurs. But that's a ridiculous discussion because Xinjiang is where so much mineral wealth is. The Chinese will, will never allow that. They didn't allow the Russians. When, when Stalin had troops on the border in anticipation that maybe they thought that they could take Xinjiang, 
because of its mineral wealth was not going to happen. And the Uyghurs, they're going to have a problem. But the United States also has a history. You want, if you're an American Indian, if you lived in the wrong place, you know what? <laughs> they moved you. Well, we can laugh all we want, but history is history. And right. every country in the world is replete with doing things that you may not like. And that's not just to justify it, but that's the outcome of it. You know, and, and what's going on in Xinjiang, the world's going to point their finger and it's a vulnerability for Xi, but he's got a lot of vulnerabilities. And I, I think that's why the point you make is, is absolutely spot on. And, and it takes some of the, uh, the conflict out that people want to just uh, rely on. So, yeah, that's a great point. And with that, I'm going to, I'm going to get off, but uh, I'll try to get back by Friday, Judd. Um, again, I'm, I'm uh, heading to Dallas in the morning, early, very early in the morning, unless somebody's got a G5 they want to fly me on, <laughs> and I can get there tonight. <laughs> uh, Don't fly American. Uh, They're all on strike. <laughs> French, French. Yeah. All right, thanks, Ira. Hey, thanks again. Uh, you're welcome. It. All right, thanks. You know, as always, I, I really, it's a good time in the room. Thanks. All right, guys. Uh, here, maybe I should um, stop recording. Okay. <laughs>